uh, new Santa Cruz Nomad, which should be hitting the stores about the time you guys get back from Interbike. Fingers crossed. Eighteen hundred and fifty dollars. Fifty bucks cheaper than the old one. Fifty bucks cheaper than the old one. Cheaper, less expensive. You like, you buy, buy two. Okay. Differences between the old Nomad and the new Nomad. The uh, the old Nomad is probably one of our best-selling bikes ever. Between that and the Blur LT, they make up bulk Santa Cruz's sales. Incredibly popular trail bikes that are really versatile, really good pedaling, and able to handle a wide variety of rider needs. So, in an effort to make the Nomad more all-round capable, we gave it a lot of the same treatment that we gave the Blur LT earlier in the year. This is the second bike to be the recipient of our new generation VPP design. By new generation, what I'm saying is we have gone to a revised lower linkage and a revised upper linkage. The lower linkage has uh, grease ports inside of the bearing. The upper linkage is made out of carbon fiber. Both of them have angular contact bearings in them with a 15 millimeter diameter aluminum axle that then has a stainless steel collet head that locks it into place. So essentially you screw that down, preload the bearing a tiny bit, and then you lock it in place holds your bearings adjusted tightly, your lower bearings, which are the ones that are going to get the most contaminants and environmental crap in them, can be purged with grease. It's quiet, it's long lasting, it's efficient, and it's probably the trickiest pivot hardware out there on any bike you'll find. The uh, rest of the bike, we've gone to a hydroform top tube as opposed to the old clamshell split welded top tube that we had. We upgraded to a 1.5 inch head tube, which we actually incorporated on the Nomad about a year and a half ago putting that across the board so you can run just about any fork you want in there. It's designed around 160 millimeter fork, has 160 millimeters of rear travel. What we did in terms of the other revision, not just the hardware of the VPP, but we also changed the shock rates. The old design had a radically falling rate at the beginning of the stroke and then a radically rising rate at the end of the stroke. There were a lot of good benefits of that. There were also a couple issues where with some large volume air shocks, people complained of sort of a hammocky sensation in the middle of the travel, and also a lot of ramp up at the end. It was really hard to bottom out for some riders. So what we've done is we flattened those curves out a little bit. Less dropping rate at the beginning of the travel, less ramp up at the end of the travel. Makes it more air shock friendly across the board, but it also makes the bike a little bit better at pedaling. The old one was a good pedaler. The new one's a phenomenal pedaler, great climber, and it's a long, linear, plush suspension. Six inches feels like a lot more most of the time and still pedals like a dream. The uh, overall frame weight of the bike has also been reduced. It's now just about as light as the Blur LT, which might create some confusion given that they're the same sort of weight, same sort of price. This one's a little more slack in its geometry, designed for a little more aggressive riding, more big all-mountain terrain. 160 millimeters rear, as I said, 160 millimeter front, the rough fork we put, you can run shorter, you can also run longer on that, but the sweet spot's right around there. The uh, Santa Cruz Blur has been the best selling bike in Santa Cruz's lineup. We acquired the VPP patents, virtual pivot point suspension in 2000, and then we came out with the first V10s and the first Blurs soon after that. The Blur immediately became one of our most popular bikes, it was a really well loved trail bike across the board. It had a little over four inches travel and was just this incredibly versatile, easy riding, sweet handling machine that had a lot of suspension potential and a pretty lightweight package. So, it evolved. It went from the Blur, then it became the Blur Classic and the Blur LT, then there was also the Blur XC that came in. The beginning of 2008, we did a revision of the Blur LT that had started effectively two years ago with a whiteboard where we asked a lot of questions like, what would be your ideal trail bike? What do you want to do? What do you love about the Blur LT? What do you want to make better? The result is the bike you see before you right here. Um, changes are many. This is the first bike that we did a sweeping revision of our VPP suspension. Virtual pivot point suspension has a lot of abilities to be altered depending on your needs. Not the least of which is you can have a lot of variability in the shock rates that you're using. Not axle path stuff, but actually the ratios at which you're compressing the shock which is going to determine the characteristics of how your rear suspension works. What we had with the old VPP design was a bike that started out with a little bit of a stiff spot at the beginning, rapidly falling rate right into a nice sort of plateau, and then a rising rate right at the end to resist bottom out. It worked really well in some instances, but there were a few issues with it, not the least of which was some people felt that it kind of hammocked in the middle of the stroke a little bit. It was really active in the middle of the stroke, but left a little bit to be desired. Either they weren't getting at the bottom out, or it was a little too stiff at the very top of the stroke. So what we did as a revision of the VPP, the VPP, was we flattened the shock rate. 
not completely flat, still falling rate to a rising rate transition, which is something that you can't really do with other suspension systems, and it still creates a lot of desirable characteristics, but we wanted to make it a little more linear. The result of this is it's plusher pedaling, or plusher suspension across the board, while still maintaining a lot of pedaling efficiency. It's a snappy pedaling bike, you don't have to use any shock platform on this at all. If you do, fine, that's a personal preference thing, but this is a very efficient pedaling machine that still packs 140 millimeters of travel into it and sucks up bumps like a king. The other aspect of this revision, we went to forged aluminum lower link with grease ports in it so that you can service it on a regular basis and a carbon fiber upper link. Same thing with the lower bearings and the lower of the upper bearings, all are angular contact bearings held in place by a big bore 15 millimeter axle. The whole thing clamps down through the swing arm. In this case, on the bottom end of it, it goes from the left side of the swing arm towards the drive side. You can remove and service everything from the non-drive side. You don't have to take your cranks off to service your bearings if you need to service your bearings. You shouldn't have to because you've got nice little grease ports and you can adjust the preload and they're sweet. So, you adjust the preload, tighten it down, things go into the frame, and then you put these little collars in here. That, that it's an angular collet that sucks into the actual bolt that goes into the frame itself, which locks that bolt in place, stops it from rotating, but also locks it into the frame. You've got short, stiff little links with large diameter axles that are held in place on the frame on one side and on the other side by these locking heads. It creates an environment where you really don't have any room for flex or play or a lot of the other lateral and torsional boogeymen that kind of mess up the way a bike handles. So you've got this very true tracking front to rear suspension system, a little bit mellower rates than before so it's, it's sort of a more user friendly suspension and it's completely serviceable and shouldn't need to be serviced on a very regular basis. While we were also redesigning the bike, we lowered standover height by over an inch and uh, kept a lot of the other sweet handling characteristics the old LT and their Santa Cruz Heckler are known for. It's a 69 degree head angle based around a 140 millimeter fork, which is right in the ballpark of things. It's like five and a half inch travel fork, which is sort of where this thing works nice. You can beef up to about a 160 mil, strong enough to handle it, it'll slacken the bike out, make it more downhill friendly, or you can shorten it down to about a 120 mil fork and the thing will be a snappy, razor sharp, almost cross country ish bike. Frame with shock weighs about 6.4 pounds. Not the lightest kit on the block, but still light enough that you can easily build up bikes in the 26 pound range without going too crazy on the wallet.